very significant. Will you stand with me for the reading of God's word? We're in the book of Ephesians, and we're going to be looking at, we're going to go through this slow, and trust me, there's way more than what I could preach on here. I could do one verse at a time, and we would still not plunge the depths that is here in Ephesians. We're going to read from verse 3 through verse 6 of chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Father, I pray this morning that you would open our eyes, ears, hearts, and minds to the beauty of your word, the beauty of this truth. I pray that you would use me this morning and that you would um, give me the ability to communicate clearly and speak your words. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So if I sound like I have a lisp this morning, I do have a lisp this morning. Um, I either bit my tongue or something, but my tongue is very sore. So um, I won't be drinking orange juice today. But there's a, there's a reason for my labored speech. Um, Paul begins this section. This section actually starts in verse 3 and goes through verse 14. And we call this a doxology. Doxology consists of two words, doxa, meaning glory, and logos, meaning words. Now that could be spoken words or written words, but these are glorious words. When we have a doxology, when you look in your Bible and it might say a doxology, that's what this is. And this section is a written statement about God's glory. And it's almost like as Paul is considering what he wants to communicate to the church in Ephesus, he wants to start off with something great, something glorious, something wonderful. So what we read here in Ephesians was never meant for controversy. It was meant for worship. And when we understand this, it will guide us in true worship of the Father. We read in here, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who is being praised in verse 3 through 14 is the Father. He is the one who in the Old Testament was praised as the God of Israel or the God Most High or the Lord, Yahweh. This is the one that Jesus spoke of when he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Paul is acknowledging the triune aspect of who God is and the role of the Father and the role that the Father plays in our salvation. So this, every part is an acknowledgement to the Father. Jesus did not give us every spiritual blessing. The Father did. Jesus did not choose us to be holy and blameless before the foundation of the world. The Father did. Jesus did not predestined us to be adopted as sons. The Father did. This was all given to us through Christ, the beloved, but it was the Father's doing. 
Why would Paul clarify this the way he does here by saying the God and Father? Look at what it says. Blessed be the God and Father. Why does he say God and Father? Almost like Jesus had a God. What's he doing there? Well, in pagan cultures, this was written to the church in Ephesus that was actually in modern-day Turkey, but was under Roman rule, and they had a lot of pagan worship. They worshiped a lot of gods. And so what Paul is doing is he is establishing this as the one true God. By stating the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul is establishing a proper understanding of the Trinity and the hierarchy within it. Bruce Ware writes this. Uh, Bruce Ware is one of uh, my professors at Southern. He taught at Western, and he's got some great connections here with the, Vancouver, or the Clark County churches, um, CB churches here. This is what he writes. He says, one of the ways Scripture presses the distinction among the roles of the Trinitarian persons is by highlighting the ultimate authority of the Father and the willing submission of the Son and the Spirit. You see this also in the book of Hebrews in chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The Father's role is supreme. Now let me just clarify something in terms of the Trinity. The Trinity is equal in nature, in virtue, but not in function or in authority or in role. Whenever Scripture specifies actions that occur between two or more members of the Trinity, the position of greater authority is always held by the Father, while the position of submission to that authority is always held by the Son and the Spirit. This is Bruce Ware writing this, and he says this next part's important here. This principle is consistent in Scripture, and there are no exceptions. The Father is, in terms of authority within the Trinity, supreme. So we have in here a doxology to the Father. The Father has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. All the gifts between verse 3 and verse 14. These are spiritual blessings that the angels do not have. They are exclusive only for those that are made in God's image. That's you and I. So let's look at these blessings, these blessings that are ours in the heavenly places that are given to us in Christ. We were chosen before the foundation of the world. God is outside of time. He alone is infinite. He alone is eternal. And and you have to understand that God existed before time. And before time, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, before anything was created, the Father said, "Let's let's make creation. And he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. This was the Father's doing. This doesn't apply necessarily to the angels that we were chosen for that relationship with him. The angels, there are some angels who are fallen. He doesn't redeem them. He doesn't make them holy and blameless. He doesn't adopt them as their sons. He doesn't give them redemption. He doesn't give them forgiveness. He doesn't even make known to the angels the mystery of his will. I mean, when this is unfolding, angels long to look into these things. The things that he's given us. Like, we think of angels as supreme and as wonderful and as amazing because they're in the presence of God, but even they are amazed and they know me. They, they've, they've seen every aspect of my life. And the angels are like, are you sure this, this is the one? This mess up? This guy? This is the one you want? You sure? Like they long to look into these things. And they're probably scratching their head. Like, really? He doesn't make known to them. We are the praise of his glory. 
Let me share with you a verse in Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Did you, did you hear that? God sings about his love for us. That's amazing. I mean, we just spent time in worship praising him and to think that he sings over us. He doesn't do that for the angels. We are the praise of his glory. And we are sealed with the Holy Spirit guaranteeing our salvation. He doesn't do that for the angels. He does that for us. These are every spirit, no, this isn't every spiritual blessing, but this is a glimpse of every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, meaning that he gives this to us and not to any of the angelic beings. The Bible makes a clear distinction between those who are in Christ and those who are outside of Christ. This is why on Communion Sunday, we say that believers only should participate in communion. A believer's baptism is when a person has professed an expression of faith in Jesus Christ because we understand that there are people in Christ and there are those outside of Christ. This is why we don't offer communion to, to babies or infants. They haven't made a profession of faith in Christ. Now, I believe in an age of accountability, but we want to see a profession of faith for those that participate in communion because the Bible makes a distinction. For those of us in Christ, these spiritual blessings are ours. For those that are outside of Christ, they are identified as wicked and filled with sin. The Bible says that they are enemies towards God. They're spiritually dead in their sins and trespasses. We just sang a song this morning about a holy God. Sin is anything that, that, that does not conform to the nature and character of the holiness of God. We're spiritually dead in our sins and we're spiritually blind. We're unable to see God. The Bible says that the devil is blinding us. The gospel is foolishness and seems nonsensical. So there, the Bible makes a distinction of those in Christ and those outside of Christ. And one of the things that's always good to do is to examine my heart and say, where am I at with the Lord? Am I in Christ? Am I outside of Christ? Do these blessings apply to me or do they not apply to me? Look at what, let's go back to Ephesians here. Even as he... That's the Father. Even as the Father chose us in Him. Now we're going to see this phrase in Ephesians a lot. In Him. This is a common saying of Paul. In Him. That is in Christ. The Him there. The He is the Father. Even as He the Father chose us in Christ. Before the foundation of the world. This is one of the most beautiful mysteries in all of my spiritual understanding, and by the way, I don't have a glimpse on nearly one millionth of a percentage of this. Like this is, this is profound, this is true, this is not controversial. You see, when I, when I became a Christian, I thought I found God. But I had no idea that God was seeking me. When I read this, I understood that God is the initiator of my relationship with him. My friend from Multnomah told me that it was like this. He said, it's like walking up to the gates of heaven and there's a sign that says, for all of those who have chosen Jesus Christ, my son, to be their Lord and Savior. And you go, that's me. And you walk in and on the other side it says, who were chosen before the foundation of the world. Which is it? It's both, but I want you to know it's God more. It's both, but it's God far more. Because I don't want to put any confidence in my flesh. I want all praise and all glory and all understanding to be for God, like, God, you did this. I love the disciple John who became the apostle John 
who wrote the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, because he's just very clear that God is the initiator on this. In 1st John 4, 19, we read this. We love because he first loved us. Like, that's just really important. Like, the reason I'm able to love him is he loved me first. For God so loved the world. John 1, 12 says this. 12 and 13. This is really important. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. Now notice, we receive. He's the initiator. He threw it at us. We received it. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now this phrase, children of God, is so important. Who were born, not of blood, In other words, my parents, uh, I wasn't born a Christian. You weren't born a Christian. This is why we don't offer communion to children. They're not born a Christian. They're not born of blood. Nor of the will of the flesh. Meaning you can't want your salvation or someone to be saved. You can't want that enough. Listen to what it says. Nor of the will of man, but of God. Your salvation, you were born again, not of the will of man, but of God. Let that sink in just a little bit. John 3, 7 says this. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who was born of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul was preaching in Mars Hill. I think this is Acts 17. The Apostle Paul was preaching in Mars Hill, and he was preaching about the resurrection of Christ. And one of the, the religious leaders looked at Paul and said, what is this man babbling about? And others put their faith in Jesus. Like the Spirit was blowing, and some people, their eyes were open, their ears were open, and they're like, I'm following Jesus. And other people were like, this guy is babbling. Why is that? God saves us. We don't save us. He saves us. Jesus said this, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws me. 1 John 5, 1 says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. The role of the Holy Spirit is to open our eyes to the need of Christ. The Holy Spirit convicts us and open our, opens our eyes to who Jesus is. And then the Holy Spirit keeps convicting us by reminding us again and again God's word. Now I want you to understand, salvation is up to God. Sanctification is up to you and me. It's our response to God. Salvation is totally of God. Sanctification is working out our salvation with fear and trembling. When you can trust that God did this before the foundation of the world, you will find that you can trust him with every aspect of your life. Look, there are people in our church right now where the the, the C word, cancer, is a very real thing. And because of God's sovereignty, Not omniscience, not his knowledge, but the fact that he's sovereign. They can take comfort in God. Not just that God knows all things, but that God is in absolute control. Sovereignty is beautiful and should cause us to worship. God's election is not based on human merit. It is based on his nature and his character. That's why we see the phrase, to the praise of his glorious grace. Now this is actually a comfort for us, because if you've ever tried to share the gospel, I've talked to people and I say, have you ever shared the gospel? I don't want to share the gospel. Why don't you want to share the gospel? I don't want to mess up and lead someone to hell. Um, You don't have that much power. (laughs) You are not able to do that. Salvation is of God, by God, for God, through God, because of God, not because of us. So if we, if we share the gospel and someone accepts it or rejects it, it's not because of me. They may not like you for sharing the gospel, but that's irrelevant. 
What they do with the gospel is between them and the Lord. That's not up to you. J.I. Packer says this in his book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. He says this, we must always remember that it is our responsibility to proclaim salvation. We must never forget that it is God who saves. It is God who brings men and women under the sound of the gospel. And it is God who brings them to faith in Christ. Our evangelistic work is the instrument that he uses for this purpose. That's why the Bible says, blessed are the feet of those who bring good news. It's our responsibility. But the power that saves is not in the instrument. Steve, that's an amazing clarinet that you have. That clarinet plays amazing music. I marvel at the music that comes out of your clarinet. Do you think I could do that if I put that to my lips? It's not the instrument. It's the one who's using the instrument. And so we are the instrument. When we share the gospel, we're the instrument. But remember, it's God in us and through us that makes it make sense or not. The clarinet's just a clarinet. Or saxophone, whatever it was. I don't don't know. The little horn thing you were using up here. Look, he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. If you were to look at the depth of the theology that is here, it's so deep. One day, we will stand before him. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Either you will do that in glorious worship and it'll just be an extension of what you've been doing your whole life or you will buckle and you will proclaim. But regardless, every one of us, for those of us who are in Christ because Jesus died on a cross for our sins and took the penalty that we deserve, and took the wrath of God that we deserve. And in exchange, because we put our faith in him, that we trust in his perfect sacrifice, we trust in what he has done alone, we put no confidence in us, but all confidence in what he has done in reconciling us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, he who knew no sin became sin, so that we can become the righteousness of God. We are holy and blameless because of Jesus. And when God sees us, he sees us as his son, Jesus Christ, who was holy and blameless. Christ's life is accredited to me. That's in Colossians chapter 3, verse 3, when Christ, who is my life, appears. So there's a yet and not yet, because the reality is I still have this messed up sin nature. The reality is, is I'm, trust me, I'm far from perfect, and so are you. We're, I'm in good company, okay? Paul says that the, the, the spirit and the flesh are waging war inside of him. I, I find more comfort with those who are waging war inside of them than the ones who don't wage war and just run blindly towards sin. That's the one I really like. Do you know Jesus? Do you know what he's done? Do you know why he did it? Do you understand what this calls us to? A life of holiness, a pursuit of holiness? Uh, the, The Christian life is one where we're supposed to be changed from one degree of glory into another in this life. But when I die, my sin nature's dead. I'm incapable of sin when I stand before God. He sees me as holy and blameless because of what Christ has done. But in this life, I battle with the flesh And I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling. And I'm supposed to be maturing. The theological term for that is called sanctification. Ephesians is going to say that we're to grow up in Christ. That's maturing. Everyone who has a saving relationship with Jesus should be pursuing holiness in our life. Grace does not give us permission to sin. 
Here's another thing. When the wrath of God is removed and, and we have that holiness that comes from Christ, not from us, when the wrath of God is removed, do you know what remains for us? The Father's love. Jesus prayed in the garden the high priestly prayer. Here's the encouragement. John 17, 26, Jesus says, I have made you known to them, and I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Here, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, Christ dwells in us. And because Christ dwells in us, the Father loves his Son. He truly loves his son. So do you know what that means? He loves you. The father loves you. That's why there's a praise to the father here. We are holy and blameless before him. All that remains is his love. So we read in here, in love, he predestined us for adoption as sons. This is so important here. We don't want to gender neutral this. Adoption as sons. Well, I'm a daughter. Let me share with you why it's important to understand adoption as sons. This was written at a time and a place, and we want to understand the text in the context, and we want to understand what the readers would have thought. So those in Rome would understand adoption as sons. This is significant. You see, if I am a, a Roman citizen and I've got three sons, my oldest son would get a double blessing. He'd get a double portion of whatever my wealth was. And that wasn't when I was dead. That was actually when I was alive. So he would live with me in my, uh, on my property or whatever, and he would get married, he'd get a house, but he could access my wealth while he was alive. He had rights to two-thirds of my wealth. Now, the other two children would have to split that one-third. But say my oldest son was a screw-up. Sorry, Caleb, I'm not talking about you this morning, because he's not. <laughs> but just say, I'm very proud of all three of my sons, but say my oldest son was a screw-up. And I didn't want to give him a double portion. I could then adopt someone else to be my son. And he would get that double portion. But let me share with you. While I could disown my own son, according to Roman law, I could not disown an adopted son. That's why it says we were adopted as sons. It doesn't say as daughters. It says as sons. This means that it's complete. You can't, you couldn't disown an adopted child. Now here's the thing about bringing on an adopted child. You could actually bring in a 30-year-old adopted son. I don't know if you knew that or not. You could bring in, and here's what you'd have to do. If you brought in somebody to be your adopted son, you'd have to pay for all their debt. Did Jesus do that for us? Did he pay for our debt? He paid for all of our debt. And he brings us in as sons. Now here's the fascinating thing. He doesn't bring us in as the younger brother of Jesus who gets one third of the inheritance. What's he bring us in as? Co-heirs. That's phenomenal. That's riches glorious. Unimaginable. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He will never abandon us. We are adopted as sons. And how did he do this whole thing? What was his motive? What was his purpose? Why would he do this? Well, Jesus said, for God so loved the world. And here it says, in love. He pre this God, God is love. It's, it's what God has been doing before the foundation of the world. He's love. The Father was perfectly loving the Son. The Son was perfectly loving the Father. And the Spirit was loving the Son. And the Son was loving the Spirit. And then God, in love, brings us in. Do you understand? At the very heart of this whole thing of salvation is a very real relationship. And you can almost understand why God would say, Jesus would say, the greatest commandment is to love God with everything we have because the Father sought us and redeemed us to a relationship with him because he loves us and he wants our love in return. 
Hallelujah. Romans 8.15 says this. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears within our spirit that we are children of God. And if children then we are heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Now let me share with you something important because we could stop right there, but I want to just share with you something. It says, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Let me share with you why I say that. Because what we're saying in that is my love for God compels me to love him regardless of anything in this world, any way, regardless of how anything happens in this world, my love for God is so great there is nothing in this world that could ever stop me from loving God. And the greatest thing that I could ever have is the love of the Father. The God, God's word is so beautiful. It is so precious. And all of this was done, not by my will. This isn't my idea. The Apostle Paul says, I was not made an apostle because this is what I wanted. I don't come to you with a message that I bring. I come with you a message that God brings. All of this was according to the purpose of his will. That's what Ephesians says. Our salvation is of the will of God. Psalm 1830 says this, as for God, all of his ways are perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. You can take it to the bank. Your salvation is extremely significant to, the, to God. It's to the praise of his glorious grace. You didn't earn it. You didn't buy it. You weren't worthy of it. All of this was given to you by grace. Everything that we have from the Father is to the praise of his glorious grace. Let me share with you, the Greek word grace combines the notion of love and loyalty that is displayed in concrete acts for the benefit of God's people without merit. Let me just share that again. The Greek word grace combines the notion of love and loyalty that is displayed in concrete acts for the benefit of God's people without merit. 